Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Remember the food pyramid? It was endorsed almost by almost every government and every health authority, with grains as the foundation. It was developed in the 1980s, endorsed by the FDA in 1992, then shortly after that, heart foundations and diabetes associations and medical associations around the world, certainly in the USA, UK and Australia. It morphed into my food plate in 2005 and more recently in Australia in 2013 into Australian Healthy Eating Guidelines, which actually looked very similar to the plate in the pyramid. It also suggested that three meals a day was important to maintain blood sugar levels and if you were on a carbohydrate-based diet, particularly if you also followed the low-fat advice that had literally been shoved down our throats for the last 40 or 50 years, then you really would need at least three meals a day. In fact, you could be excused for thinking that carbohydrates are an essential nutrient, but you might be surprised to learn that they are not. Glucose, which is which uh, is what carbs gets quickly broken down to, is not the only fuel the body uses. The body can also use fat in the form of ketones, also referred to as ketogenesis. Interestingly, cancer cells love glucose and hate ketones. Glucose is very unstable and can cause damage to our human cells. It's why diabetes is such a problem. Glucose out of control, damaging cells throughout the body. The issue of how cells get their energy is a really important one. My guest today is Professor Dominic D'Agostino, an assistant professor at the University of South Florida College of Medicine, Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology, where he develops and tests metabolic therapies, including alternative energy sources and ketogenic agents for neurological disorders like epilepsy, as well as cancer and wound healing. He's developed an approach for metabolically starving cancer cells through diet and compressed oxygen. So we do talk about breathing, replacing chemotherapy, surgery or radiation. It's a fascinating conversation. And while the first part of our discussion, look, it gets a bit technical when Dom is basically referring to parts of the brain's brain that are involved in breathing regulation. So don't get too worried about those details. And for those that really want to explore the neuroanatomy he refers to, we'll have links to an anatomy textbook referencing the brainstem. Getting the balance right of how we fuel our bodies is critical to preventing diseases. And as it turns out, holds great promise for dealing with many conditions, neurological ones like epilepsy, dementia, which is interestingly now being referred to as type 3 diabetes, as well, of course, as cancer. It's a topic we're going to be exploring in more detail in the coming weeks. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Professor Dominic D'Agostino. Welcome to the show, Dom. Thanks for having me, Ron. Great to be here. Now, Dom, you were in Australia a few weeks ago and, uh, and, and a lot of excitement there with your presentation. We're talking about, you were talking about ketogenic diets and all this, but I wonder before we got into any of that, whether you could share with us a bit of your own journey. Yeah, sure. I'm glad to. I, uh, my background is in neuroscience. That's what I uh, did my PhD in. Uh, well, I guess maybe taking a step back as an undergraduate college student, I majored in uh, nutrition. And maybe about a year or two into it, I realized there wasn't a whole lot of jobs I could get in nutrition that that I, that I really liked. So I, I double majored in biology just to have a more of a broad background because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, long story short, as, as an undergrad, I decided to do some, uh, some research and joined a lab and that really uh, interested me in neuroscience. And then I applied for a neuroscience a PhD program and I studied the neural control of autonomic regulation. So how our brain controls our body, our physiology, uh, in particular, our cardio, cardiorespiratory 
uh, sort of activities. And, and the brainstem mechanisms that do that, in particular, you know, with a big focus on, on breathing. On breathing. And on breathing, yeah. My so, favorite, a favorite topic of this podcast, actually. Really? Yeah. So I uh, trained with a lot, of, uh, a lot of really great scientists that laid the foundation of understanding breathing. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, that's interesting because uh, we, we were kind of, uh, I was thinking we were going on a, on a nutrition co- uh, pro- <laughs> direction here, but, but of course the, they're inseparable and, and talk about balancing out body chemistry. Breathing's about it really, isn't it? It's a really important part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, as a PhD student doing basic science research, I had the great opportunity to do that research in a pulmonary critical care department division, uh, a, a clinical hospital. But uh, so the the focus of our lab was was understanding uh, the drive to breathe as it pertains to oxygen chemosensitivity. So we classically know the drive to breathe, uh, is basically driven by CO2. Mm -hmm. So CO2 sensitivity and, and there's CO2 chemoreceptors that are classically shown to be on the ventral surface of the medulla. Uh, but work done in the mid eighties and nineties showed that these, uh, CO2 chemosensitive regions are distributed, uh, throughout the medulla, including the nucleus tractus solitarius, uh, the pons, uh, the locus ceruleus. Uh, there's many different brainstem areas that actually have these CO2 chemoreceptors. So the field of respiratory neurobiology was, was kind of changed. Uh, our understanding that there's multiple centers, uh, centers linked to, uh, you know, sympathetic control. Uh, and these, these respiratory centers were juxtaposed to cardiovascular centers, including the C1 sympathoexcitatory region. And that region is in the brain and it's juxtaposed to the rostral ventral lateral medulla. Uh, and that, that area of neurons has inspiratory neurons and expiratory neurons. And it's kind of a back and forth interplay between the two. So the inspiratory neurons fire and essentially that causes an inspiration. And then the expiratory neurons fire and that causes, that can help facilitate expiration. So I studied those neurons and I studied a small area within the rostral ventral lateral medulla that contr- is the respiratory rhythm generator. And that's called the pre-Botzinger complex. And that that area of the brain is uh, if you make a small ablation and, and you damage that area, it, it completely stops – the animal will stop breathing or we stop breathing. And th- those particular neurons uh, function as oxygen chemosensors in the brain. And my PhD was focused on studying the oxygen chemosensitivity of those neurons and how they sense oxygen and how that modulates – kind of our physiology and how we can modulate that. And what was the take-home message for the ordinary person who is trying to understand, okay, what was the take-home? I mean, PhDs lead you down a rabbit hole, you know, a, a hole that yeah. is so, so defined. But but there must have been a couple of take-home messages for the public. Um, you know, we, as I say, give us give us a couple of gems about breathing that you came out of out of your PhD with. Yeah, well, I got an appreciation for uh, really how how complex breathing is from a from a neurobiology standpoint, and how it's a a, a real miracle that we don't have to think about breathing really <laughs> that mm. it's an autonomic. Uh, but maybe we should. Mm. So that that brings up another kind of uh, idea: how we can modulate our breathing to control. Uh, and actually change our CO2 chemosensitivity and even change our oxygen chemosensitivity. Uh, so my my PhD work was studying an enzyme called heme oxygenase 2, and, and we determined that that enzyme functions as an oxygen sensor in that region. So that was the main finding of, of my PhD work. Uh, and that that enzyme is expressed within certain subpopulations of neurons in that area. Uh, so the some of the maybe broader implications are that 
uh, it can relate to different things like sudden infant death syndrome. So that area that, that I studied is implicated in the etiology of sudden infant death syndrome, uh, the pre-Botzinger complex, because uh, uh, children or babies will fail to gasp uh, when they are placed on their stomach when, uh, you know, when they're sleeping. Mm. And uh, that that particular area triggers the gasping response, and and that that particular area senses low oxygen, and by sensing low oxygen, it triggers the gasping response. So that's some of the, you know, some of the things, some of the implications of my work were associated with various breathing disorders, but I became kind of more interested in how extreme environments alter those neurons, mm-hmm. and also how how we can, you know, change, like how those things change with various breathing exercises, with, uh, with exercise, with changing, you know, brain energy metabolism. I was very interested in lactate and, and that, and that put me on a direction of basically studying. I, I became a very avid diver and then my postdoctoral fellowship was basically doing some research, uh, developing techniques to understand uh, the neurobiology of of breathing and and brain energy metabolism under these extreme environments of high CO2, low oxygen, high oxygen, uh, that would be experienced in, for example, military personnel or even astronauts. And and that that became uh, the 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 direction, the trajectory of my postdoctoral fellowship. Well, you know, you'd be very familiar, I'm sure, with uh, Wim Hof. Uh, we touched on on his. Uh, oh you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, he really plays around with breathing and placing the body in various states of acidosis and uh, and playing around with that acid base balance, doesn't he? In his, is that what he's doing in his uh, almost hyperventilative state? He, he does. He has a, a pretty interesting protocol that he's kind of developed through his own methodology. Uh, and we actually have uh, uh, an ethics protocol, an experimental protocol approved by our university where we're going to hopefully, if everything works out, go to Kilimanjaro and do some some studies with Wim mm-hmm. uh, and his team up there. So he's got an interesting protocol that he uses. I'm also interested in Buteco breathing. You may have heard of uh, Buteco breathing. Yes, very. What? Well, yes. Well, you know, their focus is very much on, on that end tidal CO2. That's um, right. And yep. controlling breathing. And I, I'm very familiar with that. Um, and also, what would you, what, had you found much relevance uh, between mouth breathing and nasal breathing? Yeah, I, I do. I, I tape my mouth. <laughs> for, Me too. Uh, Me too. It's like so, a sect, isn't it? Really, when you tell people, you know, it's. Uh... I know. I, I so so I can tell you, and you won't judge me. So no, I won't. That's a I good won't. thing. <laughs> but uh, but I we do a lot of research with NASA, and uh, and part of the research that we do is sleep, and we look at stress, we look at you know microbiome and and cognitive function, all these things. So I'm continuing to monitor my sleep. Mm. Uh, I was. A, a crew member on a NASA analog mission and, and, you know, I, I kind of collected data and I'm, I'm still continuing to collect data on that and, uh, and try different things to determine how it affects my sleep, you know, and, and I did, uh, I think I'm a, a nose breather anyway, when I sleep for most of the time, I think, but I, I, did wear the tape for, I guess it was a two week period and I did get exceptionally good sleep, but I happened to be home. Mm-hmm. Uh, things were a little bit more calm and then it picked up over the last month. I have not been taping, but I've also been kind of comparing, uh, nights when I wear tape and, and don't wear tape. Um, and what have you come up with? What are the, what are the big differences? Well, if I if I look at all the data when I was wearing the tape, uh, my ratio of deep sleep was uh, was was more, and and that could be perhaps you know I have to do it when uh, when I have a block of time when I'm home and I do like one week and then the next week uh, with and without tape. Uh, so I my my schedule is kind of. You know, I'm crossing time zones. Mm-hmm. Like when I flew to Australia, I was about 36 hours without sleep because I don't really sleep well on a plane, and I just worked and then 
got back on the plane again and uh, say it, that my life has kind of been like that. Um, and I think my nutrition and some things maybe I'll talk about later mm. can, can help with that, with that stress resilience. So I tend to, to maintain, you know, good c- cognitive resilience and kind of keep, keep my wits about me just for some of the nutritional mm. things that I do. Uh, but I think breathing plays a a huge role. And it's one of those understudied things. So just like I studied nutrition when I was an undergrad and it was kind of cool, you know, to full circle to come back to nutrition and, you know, for neuroscience, my, my PhD work was, was breathing and neural control breathing. And I feel like I want to bring that back into my, uh, research program. Uh, and I studied it. I I literally recorded from neurons in, in the brain. It's a technique called patch clamp electrophysiology. That's what I did in my PhD, but I would like to do it more from a sort of a systems respiratory physiology perspective. Yeah. Well, that you know, the the breathing is is music to our ears. But then it it yeah. brought you into back to nutrition. So you've done a kind of a yes. full circle. Yeah, and nutrition impacts respiration. So what we find is that uh, our uh, sort of O two consumption and CO two production uh, appears to be more efficient. You know, when we're when we're in a state of nutritional ketosis, we don't we don't produce uh, as much CO two. For example, when we're burning uh, fat instead of carbohydrates, so it tends to burn uh, give off a little more CO two. So these are things of interest to. Uh, military personnel that live in a submarine or in a space habitat because the CO2 burden of the space environment is something that needs to be dealt with by mm. by various methods. Now, now, Dom, you know, back on to where we were, this has been fascinating, we've been talking about breathing like this, it's, it's fabulous, but we hear a lot about different kind of diets, you know, paleo, ancestral, low carb, high protein, Atkins. Ketogenic is a, is a kind of word that's cropping up a lot nowadays. Can yeah. you tell us what, what is the ketogenic approach to diet? Yeah, uh, so the ketogenic is a bit of a buzz, buzzword now, but it's been around for uh, a long time, uh, nearly just about a, a hundred years. It was used clinically. The Mayo Clinic here in the United States developed the protocol uh, when they realized that Fasting, it was observed, you know, prior to the ketogenic diet, that fasting was a means to control seizures. Mm. But fast, but you know, you you can't fast someone all the time, right? You have to you have to feed them at some point. Uh, so it, it was observed that if you fed someone a diet that was primarily fat, and you adjusted the ratios of protein, so you you gave just enough protein to prevent protein malnutrition, uh, that you would that person would appear to be in a fasted state. So it would mimic the metabolic physiology. We would say of fasting, meaning that the ketone bodies would be elevated, and then the hormone insulin also would be suppressed, and the blood glucose would be sort of suppressed too. Can we just take a step back from this for one moment? Because um, I'm familiar with the term, but you know, we could almost be excused for thinking that glucose is the only fuel our body can can take or we need. And and you know, there's all lots of reasons why we we think that's a dogma now. Um, but but that's yeah. not the case. So can we take a sort of a step back and just say ketones? What what are what are the ketones? Yeah. So from an evolutionary perspective, even kind of taking a bigger step back, uh, in the absence of food, uh, we store maybe about 2000 calories in carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. And uh, even a lean person stores about 20 or 30,000 calories in the form of fat. Right. When we stop eating, we within about 24 to 36 hours, we metabolize all of our carbohydrate stores. So we start liberating and our brain, you know, is using that, that carbohydrate to make glucose. And, uh, we liberate, uh, fat from our adipose tissue for energy, but the fat doesn't really cross the blood brain barrier very well. So, uh, the fatty acid oxidation in the, the fat burning process in the liver makes these ketone bodies, which are water soluble, 
forms of fat molecules. There are smaller chain uh, carbon molecules that can readily cross the blood-brain barrier. So our body converts the fat to these ketones, and then these ketones largely replace glucose as the primary source of energy in the brain. Uh, and after about a week of fasting, you know, nearly 70% of the brain energy metabolism is derived from these ketones. And we did not know this until about 1967 when uh, George Cahill did some studies at Harvard Medical School uh, with uh, Oliver Owen, uh, a researcher uh, resident in his lab. Uh, made this observation, uh, what well, was published in, in 1967, and they looked at the blood flow going to the brain and coming away from the brain, and they did some fairly elegant uh, metabolic you know, biochemistry at the time and determined that ketones were really fueling the brain in a, in a fasted state. They fasted subjects for 40 days in that particular uh, study that was published and, you know, not, not something that you could really pass that would pass the ethics board to today. So, uh, but it, but it changed the way we think about brain energy metabolism because prior to that it was thought that, you know, the brain needed a hundred percent glucose for fuel. So the ketogenic diet then really changes the, the fuel system of the brain and, uh, and the entire body. And it also uh, changes the neuropharmacology of the brain. It literally changes some of the neurotransmitter systems that we're looking at, uh, and it and it alters the our 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 physiology and our psychology too. So it even can impact things like stress. Mm. So that's my, my wife is a behavioral neuroscientist, and and that's a big part of what she focuses on. Mm -hmm. Well, stress is another favourite topic of this uh, of this podcast as well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as it is for us all, I guess, not just the podcast. Yeah. So, so this was this was a, a, a major change in our thinking. I mean, you're talking about uh, well, okay, we we'll leave aside the forty day fast, but a one week fast uh, is that what it takes for ketones to kick in? I mean, are we talking about not eating just on water for a, a week? Yeah, well, that particular study that was rather extreme um, was a 40-day fast. But for the average person, and, and their ketones got quite high, up to 6, 7, and uh, nearly 8 millimolar, like towards the end there. But uh, – and, and, and an extension of the study that would not only not pass IR, not pass the ethics review board, but would probably be considered criminal, they injected the subjects with a dose of insulin, about 20 IUs of insulin, and they pushed the glucose down to one millimolar per liter, which is about you know 18 milligrams per deciliter. It's a, it's a very small amount of glucose in the blood. And they made the subjects severely hypoglycemic. And the subjects were uh, asymptomatic for hypoglycemia because their ketones were elevated. So it was a further dramatic demonstration that uh, the subjects could keep their wits about them and, and actually not experience hypoglycemia even at a level of glucose that would typically be fatal for the normal person that did not have ketones in their uh, in their bloodstream, so it really revolutionized the way that we kind of thought about brain energy metabolism. That there was this alternative energy that existed in our body that our body could make this alternative energy that could literally fuel our brains under certain conditions. And this in this condition, it was prolonged fasting, but that's essentially what the ketogenic diet does. It mimics the metabolic physiology of fasting and elevates those ketone bodies. Well, you know, the thing that I'm realizing as I'm talking to different practitioners about different conditions, and it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about cancer, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune condition, insulin level seems to be the common denominator and the higher the worse. So, so, yeah. so this has huge implications, of course, considering how ubiquitous diceases are. I mean, where do we start on this? I mean, yeah. um, let's let look at cancer, for example. I mean, uh, I, and I know you've done a lot of research on the neuroscience and we'll talk about these neurological diseases too, but something that's often intrigued me is that um, we very readily accept these PET scans, which are, what, tell, tell, us, tell us what the rationale behind a PET scan is with the radioactive glucose. 
Yeah, uh, the the PET scan uses something called fluorodeoxyglucose. So it is a, uh, as you mentioned, a radio labeled glucose molecule that when it's uh, when it's given into the body, uh, it, it's a very good indication using uh, positron emission tomography. We can we can measure the absorption of glucose in the tissues, the utilization of glucose in the tissues. Uh, and and the, the PET scan is essentially showing, uh, you know, if, if we're imaging a tumor or we're in, imaging the brain, it shows glucose consumption. So in an Alzheimer's disease brain, uh, it shows less fluorescence intensity because in Alzheimer's disease, the one of the hallmark characteristics is that there's glucose hypometabolism. Mm. So that's why ketones may be able to sort of rescue some of the brain, uh, uh, some of the brain cells by giving an alternative energy uh, substrate. I've heard that dementia is often described as type three diabetes. That's right. Yeah, mm. uh, it is uh, insulin resistance in the brain, so the the the, the brain can actually make. Uh, insulin too. So it's uh, this is kind of new information that's coming out, and there's there's quite a bit of interest in in that and studying that type three diabetes in the brain. Uh, so cancer, on the other end, is uh, the when a normal cell transforms into a cancer cell and becomes neoplastic. Uh, the oncogenes, so genes that cause cancer, are activated. And there's a number of, of sort of provocative agents that can transform a normal cell into a cancer cell. It could be a virus. It could be a carcinogenic chemical. It could be radiation, uh, inflammation. So, you know, chronic inflammation in tissues like the liver, for example, can transform normal liver cells to cancer cells. And when a normal cell transforms into a cancer cell, it, a number of genes are activated and these genes uh, when they're activated, the the cancer cells uh, the, transform into a type of cell that that has a classical hallmarks, and we call that you know the hallmarks of cancer, right? They have uh, increased angiogenesis, increased uh, sort of uh, inflammation, increased uh, proliferation, and, and all these things, and uh, and there's very high glycolytic uh, rates. Uh, of cancer cells about mm. up to 200 times higher than normal cells. And the PET scan uh, is used to basically identify the location and the aggressiveness of cancer uh, by the fluorescence intensity of, of the tissue as indicated by the glucose consumption of the tissue. So the higher the glucose consumption, the more it's going to be concentrated in that tissue. And cancer uh, concentrates it very high because it has a very high amount of, of insulin receptors, of the GLUT1 transporter, which is the transporter for glucose. And it's essentially starving the surrounding healthy tissue of glucose by sucking up all the glucose itself for its metabolic needs, but also the expanding biomass because the cells are replicating and they tend to use a lot of glucose and they use a lot of glutamine. Mm. This is what intrigues me about, about our modern approach to this problem of cancer. We very, very readily accept the diagnostic value of this thirst for glucose uh, but we yeah. haven't quite translated that um, <laughs> to a treatment, uh, you know, approach. Now that that speaks yeah. to a, sort of a different philosophical view of of what the origin of cancer is, isn't it? Really, I mean, there are two ways of looking at it. Yeah, and I I was really as a neuroscientist, you know, going into the field of cancer a little over uh, ten years ago, uh, when we made some observations, and I was trying to trying to understand them because I just started studying a cancer cell line and uh, just as a side project, and I, I started looking into this more, and I, I knew about a PET scan, a PET CT scan. It was sort of the it was the gold standard to really identify the location and aggressive. Of, of, of tumors, but that information was not used by the oncologist to target it. And, you know, in, in 19 or 2008, 
uh, there really was no tumor metabolism conferences. There was no cancer metabolism. Con- now there's now there's quite a few of them. There, there's a bunch of them. Uh, in 2011, uh, they were very resistant to do this because the the hallmarks of cancer was written by sort of genetic <laughs> genetic centric uh, scientists. But in 2011, they they uh, added. A metabolic dysregulation to the hallmarks of cancer. Even, you know, many decades after Otto Warburg had showed this, uh, and, and there's sort of political reasons for that and various reasons. But uh, but they added, you know, metabolic dysregulation and and you know high glycolytic activity essentially uh, to one of the uh, to the hallmarks of cancer. So now. You know, only only many decades after what Otto Warburg observed, now you have almost all these scientists jumping on the bandwagon mm-hmm. and just studying cancer metabolism. And you know, one of one of the bigger conferences was tumor, the uh, Keystone Tumor Metabolism Conference, where uh, Lou Cantley, who's one of the top cancer scientists of the world, gave the keynote talk. And part of his keynote talk was about the ketogenic diet. He he said that he personally follows the ketogenic diet. And he is his study, he uses a drug to target a glycolytic pathways, uh, the PI3 kinase pathway. And in his most recent data, the drug doesn't work uh, unless the patients are on the ketogenic diet to suppress the hormone insulin. So it only wow. works in the, and so that was, that was kind of, you know, it, we've come that far, you know, to the point where they didn't even recognize the diet as a valid therapy to where it's now part of keynote talks in, yep. in, in the major conferences. Well, can you f- just give us a, a sort of a, a 101 metabolic, that it's a, not a genetic disorder, but it's a metabolic disorder. What is, in, in very simple terms, what is the rationale behind this metabolic approach? Yeah, so the idea that uh, Otto Warburg advanced through his work on cancer metabolism and and uh, part of him receiving the Nobel Prize was uh, this work that he did on on metabolism, on cancer metabolism, and his uh, his his work basically showed that. Uh, damage to respiration and well, so mitochondria, right? Mitochondria make our ATP, our energy currency through uh, respiration and, uh, and the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell and uh, outside of the mitochondria, we can do sugar metabolism in the form of glycolysis. It's, 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 it's like a primitive form of, of uh, deriving ATP energy. And what Otto Warburg has observed was that uh, damaged respiration or damaged mitochondria basically triggers compensatory uh, fermentation so or glycolysis in cells. So the mitochondria, many cells are chock full of mitochondria. And as we progressively damage them, the same things that that cause cancer that I mentioned, radiation, chemicals, inflammation, tend to be very damaging to the mitochondria. The mitochondria have their own DNA, but they don't have the robust DNA repair mechanisms that that are uh, happen in the, in the uh, nucleus, right? The nucleus of the cell has very robust DNA repair mechanisms. So when you bombard a cell with various toxins and radiation and chemicals, from the environment, it tends to damage the DNA of the mitochondria more. And progressive damage to the mitochondria will decrease their ability to make uh, energy in the form of ATP. And then the nucleus will sense that. The nucleus will sense there's an energy crisis. And when the nucleus is the brain of the cell, senses the energy crisis, it kicks on uh, sort of a constellation of oncogenes, uh, various uh, gene pathways that can endow the cell with uh, with various uh, proliferative capacity and essentially all the hallmarks of cancer as a normal cell progressively and it's not an immediate switch but the you know as these oncogenes are activated uh, this initiates the transformation of a normal cell to a cancer cell and essentially what that means is that damaged mitochondria. 
uh, and the ketones are metabolized exclusively in the mitochondria. So as they become a progressively damaged, the cell re reverts back to sugar metabolism. So a, f a super aggressive cancer that's proliferating very rapidly will depend almost exclusively off sugar metabolism because the, the mitochondria will be so damaged. And that prevents that very same uh, cancer cell from using uh, ketones as an energy source because if the mitochondria are damaged and the cell has reverted entirely to uh, glucose metabolism and, and to some extent glutamine metabolism, it cannot effectively use um, ketones as an energy source. So that becomes sort of an underlying rationale uh, for using the ketogenic diet too. It's part of it. Yeah, well, it's uh, that's rolls off the tongue very easily, but that's huge, really, isn't it? I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's gee, that's interesting. Let's move on and find out what chemotherapies we should be. I mean, maybe we could just stop feeding the cancer cells. Yeah, yeah. So that's the obvious thing, right? Uh, that's the obvious thing. It, it's kind of unfortunate that. You know, the molecular biology uh, really was advancing very fast and, and started in the 70s and then the 80s. And and that the whole culture really uh, influenced the the uh, the track that cancer research uh, went down and, and where the funding. So that's really what it comes down to where, where the funding was allocated towards. And Travis Christofferson, uh, has a great book that, uh, that really, uh, uh tackles all this. And, uh, I, I wrote the, the foreword to the book. It's called tripping over the truth. And unlike my, my colleague wrote the book, cancer as a metabolic disease, Tom Safer. Yeah. And it's very, very, it's very, very technical. And that's great if you like technical, but if you want like a compelling, engaging narrative of cancer as a metabolic disease, tripping over the truth, I think is fantastic. And mm. when Travis asked me to write the forward to, I was very uh, intimidated because he's such a good writer. But, I, you know, I, I did my best in kind of summarizing, you know, sort of sort of why uh uh, why our, our research went down that path, you yeah. know, in the in the forward. Well, it, it's probably worth reminding our listener that Otto Warburger did his research in about the nineteen thirties, wasn't it? When did he yeah. get in the up? Yeah. So, so you know, this isn't new research. This is just research that may have not gained the recognition it deserved. Yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. That's a whole political story, isn't it? I mean, people don't yeah, often sure. don't often r relate politics to health, but gee, there is there. But now, now let's you know, you did your PhD in neuroscience, and uh, and there are lots of neurological diseases that that are affected. Can you just give a listener a little bit of a background as to some of the neurological diseases that you kind of looked at in this in this work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I was funded by the Office of Navy Research here uh, in my postdoctoral fellowship, and that research was focused on something very esoteric. It was uh, CN, central nervous system oxygen toxicity, and that's a limitation for our Navy SEALs who use uh, a closed circuit rebreather in their diving operations. So, you know, something you'd only experience, there are seizures that you'd experience breathing high oxygen in, in an operational setting. In the process of studying this, we made the observation that when you induce uh, nutritional ketosis, it makes the brain like much more resilient against oxidative stress. And it basically supercharges the brain uh, in a way that if you throw toxins, if you throw high oxygen and various things, it allows the brain to function so efficiently that it prevents it from, uh, you know, triggering seizures under conditions that it would otherwise have a seizure. So I realized that this had major implications for other neurological diseases, especially epilepsy, right? Because I also, I, I started studying nutritional ketosis for oxygen toxicity seizures because the ketogenic diet was used for drug-resistant epilepsy. So now we're studying things, alt, uh, Alzheimer's disease, something called Angelman syndrome. Uh, we do work on ALS. Uh, we, uh, my colleagues study autism. 
uh, which is also associated, you know, with brain energy metabolism. We are looking at, uh, we've done research on wound healing, showing that there's an increase in blood flow to the wound. And there's also an increase in brain b- blood flow that, you know, people have shown previously. Uh, so we're, we're studying glucose transporter type 1 deficiency syndrome, uh, a lot of rare disorders that you may have not heard of. Kabuki syndrome is something that I had, a, you know, that's a rare genetic disease that it causes a metabolic dysregulation in the brain. And there's literally no, no therapy for it. But the children or adults that have this are very responsive to the ketogenic diet because uh, the, the ketogenic diet, for for reasons we don't fully understand yet, it helps bring the brain back to metabolic homeostasis. It helps to correct sort of the aberrant activity uh, even in the presence of a persistent molecular pathology, it can almost silence uh, some of the symptoms of the disease uh, just by restoring, you know, normal brain activity through nutrition. And it's mm. it's kind of amazing that that it can do that. Uh, so it doesn't always, you know, cure. It doesn't cure it, but it can silence the many of the symptoms of for example uh, angelman syndrome the the uh, the seizures that kids have and they also have impairment of motor function and it improves that too but it can control the seizures so when there's no therapies you know it, it's amazing that a diet can you know you can use a diet and it works better than any drugs that we have out there for many of these diseases I mean, you've mentioned a lot of different diseases there, but two stand out for me, and they're kind of at at opposite ends of life's journey, I guess. And one is dementia and the other is autism. Given your research, as you reflect back on on the trends, which are kind of frightening uh, for both of those conditions, what, what what do you look at, what do you think is going on there? Why are we seeing such a rise in these conditions? Yeah, you know, I uh, a, a good friend and colleague of mine in, in Puerto Rico. That that's uh, what his major focus on. He just had a, a big autism conference. Had about two hundred people there because uh, there's a there's quite a lot of. Uh, 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 there's a spike in autism in in Puerto Rico in certain areas. So it, it could be environmental. Uh, it could be uh, an interaction of. You know, a lifestyle with the environment, with, you know, uh, genetics to play, definitely play a role in in some cases. But it's likely that in in many children that have autism, there's a gene that is activated uh, in some kids and, and in others. Uh, that gene stays dormant. So there, there's something in our food, there's something in our maybe daily activity or our environment that's activating an otherwise dormant, uh, a gene that stayed otherwise dormant, mm. you know, for, for most. So it's not likely that we're changing. Uh, there, there's definitely a lot of people studying autism are looking at the genes, but our, our genomes did not change yeah. <laughs> that. Yeah that that fast you know we don't have a germline uh shift you know and and that fast so something in the environment is triggering it yeah and and are you seeing good risk i mean you're saying that the ketogenic approach is a good way of controlling or slowing down not necessarily curing curing is a big word uh, but mm-hmm. controlling slowing down how what word would we use to, to for things like dementia or autism have we seen positive um, positive response to this ketogenic approach? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I do get contacted by a number of uh, parents that have kids that have autism. And in many cases, it's been sort of the, the one thing that stands out that has helped. And uh, and you can also go on PubMed and find case reports and studies now where they ha- have demonstrated this with the ketogenic diet. The first study, it wasn't a study. It was a, a case report that was presented at a conference and what are we 2018 maybe in 2010 where they showed a video of a child with that was severely autistic before and after the ketogenic diet and the 
the title of the presentation was quite uh, compelling, so I, I had to go to it. I had something else I wanted to see at the time, but I, I left that and went to that, went to this, and uh, and it was like the ketogenic diet, you know, puts a child into remission, and it, it really, and it was mm. a casein-free, so a dairy-free. Uh, ketogenic diet and it had a remarkable effect and you know a year or two after that then it was on PubMed so they published it as a case report and now now there's a number of clinical trials that are being done my colleague uh Susan Massino uh, at Trinity College has, has published some work in this, and uh, and Jung Ro, uh, he's uh, the director or, ch or chair of, of pediatric division in Calgary. Uh, he has a number of researchers working on the mouse models of this that that seem to re recapitulate many of the the symptoms in mouse models, and, and they're looking at that. So uh, there's some preclinical work you know, mechanistically being done to determine why the diet's working, almost working backwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, there's various clinical trials that have started and are ongoing. And many of these trials, you need a couple years to really fully assess sort of the effects. And, and then you have the question, you know, what is the optimal ketogenic diet? There's many forms <laughs> of the ketogenic diet. Was actually going to be my so next question, so becomes, uh, Dom, which was let, yeah. let's get down to a nut and bolt and say, well, w what is it? I mean, what is our is our carbo? How do you measure your carbohydrate? Your you know what what is it? What, what is it in real terms? Sure. What yeah. did you so have for key, breakfast this morning? Uh, yeah. So the ketogenic diet is uh, much different than other diets because it has a very objective sort of uh, criteria, a ketogenic diet elevates your ketone levels. So if someone says they're following a ketogenic diet, but they're not measuring ketone levels or they haven't confirmed a state of nutritional ketosis, then I would say they're not, they're not following a ketogenic diet. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that clinically, you know, it's defined by an elevation of ketones. And to achieve that, what you have to do is, is use a fairly, from a medical sense, it needs to be a fairly specific macronutrient ratio of fats to proteins to carbohydrates. And uh, so the classical ketogenic diet is nearly, is, is about 85% fat and let's say about uh, 10 to 12% protein with a very minimal amount of carbohydrates in the form of uh, non non uh, starch non sugar carbohydrates so fibrous vegetables you know usually mm -hmm, green mm -hmm, vegetables mm -hmm. yep. and that's the classical ketogenic diet uh, in adults they use what's called the modified ketogenic diet which is a little bit more liberal in, in protein so it's like 20 to 25 percent protein and the rest basically fat and you do you do get five some adults can get up to 10% of their calories from carbohydrates in the form of non-fiber or uh, fibrous carbohydrates. So no starch, no sugar, and salads, think salads, green vegetables, asparagus, cauliflower is okay, uh, you know, broccoli, those kinds of things, mm. nuts, avocado. Uh, it, but it really comes down to the macronutrient ratio. Yeah. So. Theoretically, you could you could have any food. I mean, you could have pure sugar. It just needs to be. Uh, you need to stick adhere to the macronutrient ratios, and you stick to those ratios. You calculate it. You you me measure it out. Eat it and stick to it, and your body goes into a state of ketosis. So, so are you following a ketogenic diet? <laughs> I uh, I got interested in in kind of understanding, you know, what it would be like to be in a state of ketosis when I started studying this in 2008 or, eight or nine. So I bought a book by Eric Kossoff at uh, Johns Hopkins, which was the medical version of the ketogenic diet. And I bought a scale and I, I you know, weighed everything out yeah, and yeah. I was eating butter and heavy cream. And, and I found it to be, uh, in the beginning, I, I'm pretty strict. Like I, I can pretty much tolerate anything. And uh, I, I found it to be 
a bit challenging and, and, and it gave me insight in understanding what the parents go through when they have to give this to their kids and even adults. And then shortly after I started doing this, the next book, uh, Eric Kossoff next book came out and it was talking about the modified ketogenic diet. And then instead of, you know, 12% protein, it was like, Oh, I could have 20 or even almost 30% protein. And then, uh, the diet became, uh, much easier for me to follow. I started mm-hmm. studying or I started literally, uh, just checking that I bought all the supplies we were using in the lab at the time to measure in mice and rats, but I, I would do it myself for maybe about three or four weeks and then, and then kind of go back to just like a paleo. I was kind of interested in the paleo diet yep. at the time, but it was like low carb paleo. Then I would switch to the ketogenic diet, you know, and, and test different things. I was, I got interested in, uh, medium chain triglycerides and coconut oil. Yep. So I was, you know, I would do the diet with and without MCTs to see that effect. Mm-hmm. And, and then I started getting more into the ketone supplements too, and the ketone esters and we were developing those. So I was testing myself, you know, with and without, you know, the ketone esters. Uh, so I, I've been a constant experiment myself, but mm. we're at, at the same time, you know, we're running experiments in the lab day in and day out. And then I go home and I continue the experiments on myself. So it's, it's kind of fun. I, I like doing it. And you mentioned that the ketogenic diet mimics fasting, but what about fasting? Yeah, it, it mimics fasting in that. Uh, so if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're adhering to it, as you're, as medically you're supposed to do, and you were to pull blood from a person, if I was to take your blood, if you're on a ketogenic diet, and look at the major metabolites and, and hormones. So if I measured your ketones, I see your ketones are up, and that 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 occurs when you're fasting, and then your blood glucose would likely be lower, and then your insulin levels would also be lower. You know, lower mm-hmm. than normal. Uh, I measure my insulin quite often, and it's usually on the very low end, the normal range. Uh, it's in it's in the the what would be considered the healthy range. It's just uh, in the low end of normal. It's somewhere around like two or maybe three, mm. and with the, with the scale being you know two two to ten yep. or something. So um, so th- this is an indication that your body's using fat for energy. Uh, it, it's also you know, these are things that are that are uh, dysregulated in people that have like obesity and type two diabetes. So it's pushing things in, and you could say type two diabetes is carbohydrate intolerance, right? So mm-hmm. uh, as I started, you know, researching this, it became kind of quite obvious to me. There wasn't a whole lot of research, you know, at the time. Uh, Atkins, Dr. Atkins did some research, but that diet was really what I would call not, not the healthiest ketogenic diet. I I think there's, I think we have a more of an appreciation for nutrition now and, and how you can formulate the diet in ways that, that can kind of, kind of be more healthy. Uh, but it, it, did occur to me that maybe the low hanging fruit was the the big issue that at least in America, maybe, maybe in Australia to some extent too, but in America there was just, you know, 10, 12 years ago, the skyrocketing, uh, obesity and type two diabetes problem. And, and it seemed like that was a problem of carbohydrate intolerance. And it seemed like the, the ketogenic diet or at least carbohydrate restriction was a solution to that. Yeah. Well, you know, if we were to take a step back from, I mean, I think if people have got a neurological condition or or they're wanting to go on to that ketogenic diet, it's it's very challenging and it's an interesting social experiment as well, really, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, talk about isolating yourself and and uh, but 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 if we wanted to, if we wanted to, with everything we've learnt or you've learnt about ketogenic diets and fasting and blood sugars and and breathing. What would be two or three or more tips that you might leave our listener with? You know, that, that you know they were thinking, "Wow, this is something I really need to explore." What What are the lessons that you'd like to share with our listener? Yeah, uh, well, I, I learned that I never thought that I would be, uh, you know, following the ketogenic diet as a lifestyle. When when someone mentioned the ketogenic diet to me 15 years ago, I had a very negative view of it. You know, it just seemed very unnatural. Uh, whereas I, I think being in a state of ketosis, 
it, it's actually pretty natural, maybe not to be continuously in it, but I think it's very unnatural never to get in a state of ketosis. I think we can all agree that, you know, early humans had limited food availability uh, periodically. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, occasionally doing something like intermittent fasting uh, provides some benefits. Intermittent fasting was not something I did years ago, but over the last two or three years, I've incorporated it into uh, my lifestyle, but I don't do it every day. I maybe do it two or three times a day. But what I do personally, and what I think maybe others may benefit from, is that I do a low carb, modified ketogenic diet combined with intermittent fasting, meaning that if I'm um, you know, doing another term for intermittent fasting is time restricted eating, right? So essentially if I, uh, I just, I ate, you know, dinner a while back for me, it's like, you know, uh, eight o'clock, 8 PM and I will not eat again maybe until 2 PM tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to do an intermittent fasting day and that would be, uh, 18 hours, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Uh, without eating. And my first meal would probably be a high fat meal. I'll might have a ketone supplement or I might have, uh, you know, just a ketogenic meal so I can continue to sort of stay in a state of ketosis because I know I'll be kind of doing some academic work or, you know, be pretty busy at work at that time. And, uh, and I, I can sort of benefit and stay in this mild state of ketosis all the time. And I think that has real world benefits because, you are transitioning your body to be fat and keto adapted. And when you do that, it enhances your mitochondrial health, your mitochondrial biogenesis. Our body makes more mitochondria. And uh, and it has a lot of benefits as far as inflammation too. Being in a state of ketosis tends to suppress systemic inflammation in our body, which is a driver for many of the age-related chronic diseases. If I have to say the major... the the most beneficial thing that I've seen come out of being in a state of ketosis is a suppression of inflammation in my body. And I measure things like C-reactive protein and we do cytokine profiles and things like that. And uh, I, I've tracked all these things for, for years and that's been the biggest sort of uh, what I think could be the possibly the biggest biomarker mm. is that suppression of inflammation. And, and everybody seems to experience that uh, to some extent usually. And, and that can be very beneficial. And, there, and there's different ways to sort of implement sort of this metabolic therapy. You could do periodic intermittent fasting. You could do just carbohydrate restriction, not necessarily the ketogenic diet, or just periodically do the ketogenic diet. Whether you should be on the ketogenic diet all the time, uh, probably not. But I would say consider it, you know, unless you have, unless you're metabolically managing something like cancer or epilepsy or, or other things that are, you know, clinically responsive to the ketogenic diet. But I do consider it a tool in the toolbox that a normal healthy person can periodically do the ketogenic diet and, and get some metabolic benefits and health benefits from it. Well, that's brilliant. And, and just uh, on that, so the, you know, because we do hear a lot about low carb. What does low carb mean to you? Grams per day? Yeah, grams per day. So it depends. So low carb, uh, some of the athletes that I, that I talk to have such a high output that they're, you know, they're working, you know, five, six hours a day, like on the bike or running or swimming. Mm. So their low carb is like 250 grams of carbs a day or 300 grams of carbs a day yep. sometimes. Uh, but my low carb, I'm like, a, you know, I'm behind a desk a lot of time just working or in the lab and, and not too active, you know, occasionally I try, try to get to the gym or whatever. And for me, uh, low carb is, uh, under a hundred grams a day of fibrous carbohydrates. And that's very doable for mm -hmm. most people. Mm -hmm. And on the days, uh, and I rarely get that high. Typically most days I'm 50 grams of carbs or less. And that's from, uh, s salads. I, I have salad every day, uh, asparagus, broccoli, uh, I make a what's called a cauliflower mash, so yep. it resembles mashed potatoes, but uh, asparagus, uh, Brussels sprouts, kale, 
spinach. Uh, these are all the, the foods that, you know, are in the shopping cart. And I try to, you know, source things out locally, try to visit some of the local farms. Uh, I love broccoli though. So I'm eating a lot of broccoli, asparagus, cauliflower, and salads. Yep. So make a big part. And avocado too. Yep. I have, you know, one every day probably. And fats, good fats? Yeah, good fats. Uh, I do... Uh, macadamia nuts are, are very ketogenic food. They actually have a perfect ketogenic ratio. So they can be eaten just as whole nuts. We can, you can put them in a, a good high power food processor and quickly make macadamia nut butter, which is really good, especially if you're like hiking or camping and put some of that into like a jar or, uh, like a little Ziploc bag or something like that. It's like a lot of calories and a little bit of space and a lot of nutrition, Uh, and then I actually have the opportunity to test a lot of the new ketogenic foods that are coming on the market. Like I have, uh, ketogenic cookies, ketogenic, uh, brownies. Uh, I got, I got low carb pasta that's made with like almond flour and stuff. I have to try that this week. So, uh, I'm lucky to, to try that. So these, these foods didn't exist a few years ago and they can make, following low carb or even following ketogenic, uh, a reality much easier because there's some comfort foods that a lot of people don't want to go without. But I think Hmm. new creative recipes are allowing people to, uh, and, and I actually test them. So I don't, I, I don't let these companies off the hook. Like if, if it doesn't work about, you know, about 60 to 70% of the foods people send me don't work, but the ones that work, I usually, I'll plug them, I'll put them on my website. You know, I'll literally check the ketones over time and if it kicks me out of ketosis, you know, I'll mm. let the company know, you know, you got to go back to the drawing board. And why, why, not, doesn't that, why doesn't that surprise me, Dom, having just listened yeah. to you? I, I'm fairly, I could just love to see your, you know, your restaurant, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> if you were doing a restaurant review, it would be a biochemical analysis of everything we've eaten. But, but listen, one last right. thing I wanted to ask you, um, taking a step back from all of this um, and just observing as, a, as an observer of life and a participant in it, what do you think our greatest challenge for individuals is as we journey through life in this modern world what do you th- you know on our on our health journey what do you what do you think the greatest challenge is uh you know i, I do think it is stress uh my my uh, you know my my sister i just saw i didn't even know it at the time but i saw my sister post on facebook that she's going back to school she's a nurse practitioner and she sees so many patients that are depressed and is from anxiety and stress and i know i know you're podcast is about stress and being in the world of academia, there's a lot of pressures in academia. And, and, you know, I face stress along the way, uh, many times. And, and there's, there's, you know, a, a couple things that I really need, uh, to have in my life to decrease stress. And that's, you know, healthy relationships, you know, my family, my wife, of course, and the, to, to have creative downtime every day, you no, know, no matter what, no matter what's going on in my life, uh, you need recreational time. You need play time. You know, right before I got on this podcast, uh, I take my dogs for a walk and we go running in the park. We'll do some sprints and things like that. And nutrition, of course, you know, I'm all about that, but also sleep. So sleep relationships, uh, nutrition, and I would say creative downtime, you know, work, we want to, you know, have a job where that, that really excites us and everything, but we need to have a life outside of work and, uh, and actually schedule in, like, look at your calendar, look at your schedule for the day and actually schedule in that creative downtime. Because if I don't do it, it doesn't happen. I get so into my work and it's a good thing to some extent, but, uh, I, I become very unbalanced and unhappy if I'm all about work. I need to schedule that creative downtime in. So sort of that, those things right there, but in balance. That's, that's great, and you've given us so much. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I've so enjoyed talking to you today. Thanks for having me, Ron. I appreciate it. Now, if you've been following the podcast, you will know that keeping insulin levels low is the key to cardiovascular health, controlling or avoiding diabetes, almost every autoimmune condition, and of course, cancer. 
And the best way to do that is to lower your carbohydrate intake and eat healthy fats. Fasting also has an important role to play, and that's another theme we'll be exploring in a lot more detail in the coming weeks. So what is low carb? I think measuring your carbs for a week or two is a great investment in your health, just to get a handle on how much you're consuming, how much you're actually consuming. Dom mentioned a figure of 100 grams of carbs per day. For example, a medium apple is 21 grams of carbs. A banana is 24 grams and one medium-sized potato is 33 grams. So we're already up to 75 grams of carbs per day just there. A slice of bread is 12 grams. So a sandwich, two slices of bread, is 24. And bingo, you're up to 100 grams. It doesn't take much. Personally, I try to maintain 70 grams per day. I think that is achievable. I think it is sustainable. I've certainly found it to be like that. Um, Now, when you, you fast, your body goes through the glucose stored as glycogen very quickly. And after a short while, you might start burning fats. And as Dom mentioned, in human history, it's unnatural for us not to be burning fats. I've been doing, well, 16.8 or 18.6 for a few months now, and it's really quite easy. That means 16 hours of not eating and eight during a period of eight hours where I, I will have two meals, or 18 hours of not eating and six hours of eating two meals. So for example, I might eat dinner at six or seven, then the next meal in the evening, and then the next meal would be one o'clock the next day. So 16 hours of fasting, 16 to 18 hours of fasting and six to eight hours a period of eating. And I'm also going to be uh, trying fasting for a day or two or three on a regular basis. As I say, we're going to be um, exploring that and I'm, I'm reading a lot about the benefits of that and they can be quite profound. So we'll be exploring fasting and ketosis in more detail in the coming weeks ahead. And the idea that cancer rather than being a genetic disease, is actually a metabolic disease. Now, that's an important concept because it gives you more power over what you feed or starve your cancer. Food for thought. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Get-